Wow, what a great group of people, both here in the room and online. And it's terrific to see, you know, um, Canadian domestic aid service organizations really mobilizing around uh, the Global Fund in Canada's commitment. It's great to see Canada's international development groups also mobilizing and recognizing the incredible impact that the Global Fund has, both in terms of tackling HIV, TB, and malaria, but also more broadly looking at issues of gender inequality and looking at um, universal health coverage and looking at broader resilient uh, health systems and sustainable health systems. So this is, this is terrific. It's also amazing to have in the room with us um, experience at the front lines as being SRs and sub-recipients and principal recipients of Global Fund programming. So hope to hear lots from you and your experiences um, working with, uh, with local agencies at country level. Um, so uh, it's also really nice to see everybody back again. We did, uh, we gathered together two, three years ago in 2016 um, as we were getting ready to host the, sixth, the fifth replenishment, which was hugely successful. Um, and thanks to all of you for all of your support in making it successful. So we're looking forward to our continued collaboration. And this is just one of the early initiatives. There will be others down the road as we look at the Global Fund 6 replenishment, which will happen in Lyon, France in October of this year. This is a really, really exciting time for the Global Fund, and I know Peter will get into it uh, in greater detail, but it is at midpoint in the Global Fund strategy to save lives and invest for impact and ending epidemics. Uh, the strategy that started in 2017 and runs until 2022. And it's at this midpoint that we see um, amazing results that have been generated through the work of the Global Fund and its partnership, its broad partnership with civil society and co affected communities, with private sector, private foundations, implementing countries, and of course our donor countries, especially in the West. Couldn't do it without us. Um, and so we're here today to talk about how we can help to mobilize and help strengthen the Global Fund moving forward so it continues to generate the uh, impact that it has in all of the different areas. And of course, the strategic plan of the Global Fund has four key pillars. Maximizing impact against HIV, TB and malaria. Promoting and protecting human rights and gender equality. Building resilient and sustainable systems for health and mobilizing increased resources. So as we all know, the Global Fund is the lead international multilateral organization that is funding HIV, TB and malaria programs around the world. It also is extremely unique in how it approaches these three issues of, of global co public health consequence in terms of really trying to get at the root drivers of what is fueling these three epidemics and really trying to build enabling environments from the ground up. And of course, that takes partnership across all of the stakeholders. Um, what you will have in front of you and that you can take home with you, um, we also have them in French. And uh, Laura, would we be able to get soft copies of these two so that our friends who are online? Terrific. So we have this great infographic on the results 2018 report which was uh, released late last year, and the state of the fight on the second side. So it, great, it gives a great snapshot of where the Global Fund is at its mid-course in its strategy. Some ex extremely impressive results. Number one being 27 million lives saved since its creation in, 20, and in 2002. Then we have a brochure here on Canada and the Global Fund, and this details uh, Canada's history working with the Global Fund from day one, looking at also Canada's commitment over the last several replenishments. And of course, Canada has been one of the leading donors in uh, the Western world in terms of continually to increasing its uh, commitment to the Global Fund by 20%. So we are looking forward to engaging with, with uh, the government and hoping to continue that trend of demonstrating strong global leadership. Then we also have a copy of the investment case. Thank you. 
very much. This is the summary investment case, which gives an overview um, of the Global Fund's ask for this next replenishment round. The full um, report will actually be this big, around that big, and it will be released. It's a confidential advanced copy to <laughs> For the VIP. <laughs> so um, it will be released next week at the preparatory meeting, which is what kicks off the replenishment period, which is being held in India. And of course, as Peter will talk about, this is a significant place um, for the Global Fund to kick off its replenishment period because India, it's the first time that the preparatory meeting is being held in an implementing country, number one. So that is amazing, demonstrates true commitment. It's also the leader in, H in TB and HIV infections, as well as malaria, but in particular for TB. And so following off the high level meeting on TB that happened in September of 2018, this, we are able to continue to shine the spotlight on the importance of increasing our commitments and our action to, to end the TB epidemic. So again, that is uh, next week. Uh, the full investment case will become available online on February 8th, and you will find the full methodology as well as additional case studies and so forth um, that help build the case for a fully funded global fund. Great. Um, so with no further ado, um, are there any questions at this point before I hand it over to Peter? Again, what we will do, we'll hand it over to Peter and then we'll open it up for a group discussion. Shelley. Great. Um, so Shelley uh, was just reminding us that for folks who are joining us online, um, Shelley is behind the computer here and is going to be moderating the online questions. So if you do have a comment, a question, please raise your hand. There is a raise your hand function in the top ruler of your uh, Zoom platform. And Shelly will, uh, will make sure that we are able to hear your question. Great, thank you. So now over to Peter. Um, Peter has been the executive director of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria for almost a year now. Nine months. Nine months. No, actually 10 months. About 10 months. Almost, yeah. Wow, as time flies. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're thrilled to have you in Ottawa. Absolutely. I'm thrilled. delighted to be here. So, uh, until June 2015, he was the group CEO of Standard Chartered Bank, one of the world leading international banks. Um, Peter brings a wealth of knowledge around public private partnerships and innovative financing, which is very exciting to all of us. From 2015 to 2018, Peter was a research fellow at Harvard University, dividing his time between uh, the Center for Business and Government, most of our uh, many, the Center for Business and Government at the Harvard Kennedy School and the Harvard Global Health Institute. He served on various boards and commissions, including a lead non-executive director of the UK Department of Health a director of the World Economic Forum and co-chairman of Davos, member of the International Advisory Board of the Monetary Authority of Singapore, member of China's People's Association for Friendship with Foreign People, Global CEO Council. Wow, this is impressive. Uh, he graduated from Oxford University with a first class degree in politics, philosophy and economics. Um, and this year, Peter is leading the Global Fund through its sixth replenishment cycle. The replenishment conference, as we have uh, spoken about, will be held in October in Lyon, France. And building on the success of the fifth replenishment that was hosted by Canada in 2016 in Montreal, the Global Fund recently announced a fundraising target, uh, as we all know, of at least $14 billion for the sixth replenishment to help save 16 million additional lives, avert 234 million infections, and help to get the world back on track to end HIV, TB, and malaria as epidemics by 2030. So please uh, welcome, uh, give a warm welcome to, to Peter and... Uh... Thank, you. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to be in Ottawa, despite the weather, um, and it's great to have the chance to speak to you all. Um, we do have some slides, I'm not gonna use them, um, uh, partly because I think many of you are very well informed about these matters and um, I don't want to waste time um, repeating facts you know already, and partly because 
it never works as designed for people who are, are online and on the phone. So I thought I'd just um, talk. Um, what I thought I'd do is give you a little bit of a personal perspective of where we are in the fight and how that sets up um, the replenishment process and how I see that both in respect to Canada specifically and in the role of um, civil society. Uh, so where are we in the fight? Well, the reality is, as all of you who've been in, involved in the Global Fund know, is that huge progress has been made. We've had dramatic reductions in mortality, particularly in malaria, also in AIDS, less so um, uh, in TB. But in all three diseases, significant progress has um, been made. And when we talk about the challenges of the future, we shouldn't let that kind of diminish what actually has been um, achieved. The very fact that we're now talking about ending the epidemics as opposed to simply stopping people dying is a massive shift. That said, we do face big challenges. And the fundamental thesis of this replenishment is that we cannot just keep going as we are going. That is just not enough. We have to step up the fight. We are not on track towards ending the epidemic by 2030. We have to do something different. And that is both about doing things different and about having more money to do things different. Talking specifically on the three diseases. On HIV, the great achievement has been the scale up of antiretroviral treatment. Um, that has saved millions and millions of lives and transformed the situation. However, there are still far too many people who are HIV positive and do not have access to antiretroviral treatment. But, but perhaps the even bigger problem is that we are not making enough progress on prevention. And, and frankly, one thing we have learned is that you cannot treat your way to ending the epidemic. Um, you have to scale up primary prevention. And massively oversimplifying, but there are two big themes around prevention that we need to um, really push. One is adolescent girls and young women. Most people in the West, outside the public health community, do not know that if you were to draw a picture of the next most likely person to catch HIV, it would be someone like a 17-year-old girl. That comes as a surprise to most policy um, makers. Um, and, and the scale of it, we're talking roughly a thousand adolescent girls and young women being infected every day. And if you look at the demographics, and if you take a country like Zambia, roughly 40, there are roughly 45% more five-year-old girls than there are 15-year-old girls. So you just run the math. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to make significant reductions in infection rates simply to end up with the same number of people with HIV. Um, and that's not good enough. We, we need to massively reduce um, the numbers of adolescent girls and young women um, being infected. And this takes us way out of the biomedical sphere because actually HIV infection of adolescent girls and young women is simply the end result of deep, nasty, structural gender inequality, sexual violence, educational disadvantage, economic disempowerment. It's a, it's a, it's a cocktail of things um, that we need to work with partners on, but work fast and scale. And my big worry about this is not that there are not some great things going on, and there are some fantastic programs, both funded by the Global Fund, by Dreams, by others, um, but they're just not big enough. And, 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 they're, they're, and they're tackling aspects of the problem rather than the problem as a whole. So for example, we're paying girls to stay in school because the evidence is compelling that if they stay in school, they're more protected. The trouble is what happens when they graduate and how do they make themselves economically sustainable? So that's one big um, issue on the HIV front. A second one is, is frankly key populations in, in many, many countries around the world. In many countries where we have seen um, uh, the, the aggregate stats on HIV improving um, significantly, what we've ended up with is concentrated epidemics among men who have sex with men, sex workers, people who inject drugs, transgender, other disadvantaged, criminalized, stigmatized uh, populations. And that um, underscores um, the importance of all the work around uh, human rights and, and the population specific interventions. Jumping on to, um, I'll, I'll do malaria next and then TB. Um, on malaria, basically we've got two different stories going on. We've got one story, which is a very positive story of a significant number of countries making good progress towards um, 
eradicating malaria. And the, the challenge there is simply to keep them focused on it while malaria becomes less and less politically important because fewer and fewer people have it. Um, uh, uh, so that's one challenge. But actually the really biggest challenge and the one that has really sort of broken my mind since I've been at the job is the fact that in the most heavily burdened countries, we are making progress every year in saving lives, but we are actually not doing enough to interrupt the transmission dynamics. Um, so roughly speaking, the number of cases bounces around, but there's no positive trend on the, on the, the number of cases. And as populations increase, actually per capita spending on malaria in these places is going down. And we run the risk of actually moving in significantly in the wrong direction in the highest burden places in the world. And particularly if you put in the backdrop the fact that we're seeing increasing vector mosquito resistance and drug resistance, um, there is a real urgency about raising our game in the most significantly affected um, uh, countries of, on malaria. Um, and just to remind you, 60% of the people who die of malaria um, are children under the age of five, and the next most um, vulnerable um, segment of the population are pregnant women. On TB, TB, as Robin said, um, uh, has is got greater focus um, since the UN high level meeting. Um, TB has always been the poor cousin um, among infectious diseases. And reflecting that fact, we've actually made less progress against it. Um, and TB is now the largest killer of the three diseases because we have reduced mortality by um, uh, less. And you, we are definitely making TB a bigger part of the story this time um, because it needs to be. Um, uh, and because there is a degree of energy around it following the UN high level meeting um, uh, last year. And as Robin said, we'll be using India, which is a country with over a quarter of the world's TB, um, and which where Modi and Modi's government are actually taking some pretty good action against TB um, as an example and an opportunity of what should be done. There are fundamentally two challenges um, on TB, which aren't difficult to explain. Um, I've got quite good as a non-scientist, non-clinician at trying to simplify these things into kind of <laughs> things that I can get. The, the challenge on um, TB is really simple. Um, roughly speaking, there are 10 million people a year who fall sick with TB. We diagnose and treat 6 million. You don't have to be an epidemiologist to know that if you're missing 4 million people a year, you haven't got a grip on the disease. The second big challenge on TB is the MDR TB, which is one of the nastiest diseases in the world, um, uh, is basically out of control. Um, there are roughly speaking 600,000 people with MDR TB. Uh, we diagnose and treat about 25% of them. And just to put this in perspective for you, um, and I don't mean this to diminish Ebola at all, but uh, to give you a sense of how serious MDR TB is. Um, the fatality rate on Ebola is roughly speaking about 50%. The fatality rate on MDR TB is roughly speaking about 50%. Ebola is transmitted by um, bodily fluids. You actually have to interact with somebody's fluids. Um, TB is actually much more infectious. If you're within a meter of somebody, waterborne particles, you can get infected by um, MDR um, uh, TB. So same fatality rate, more infectious. There are six to 700 people in the world with Ebola at the moment. There are about 600,000 um, uh, people with MDR-TB. Again, this is not to diminish Ebola at all. Very serious threat. I'm very pleased that we are mobilizing huge resources to deal with it. I'm just rather shocked at the relative lack of excitement um, and worry about the threat of MDR-TB. So we have some big challenges um, across all three diseases, and which is why we have framed the investment narrative um, as being one of, of stepping up the fight. Um, there's one other aspect of the um, investment narrative that I think is worth highlighting because it is rather different from previous replenishments. If you look at the investment cases for previous replenishments, they've been almost entirely framed within a discussion about the three diseases. Um, on this replenishment, we have deliberately said, when you invest in the global fund, you get two things you get progress against the three diseases, and you get progress on the overall agenda towards SDG3, 
and universal health coverage, i.e. we're driving the development of health systems um, uh, overall. And we've been much more explicit about that than in um, previous replenishments. Um, and that's not just a kind of change of message. It reflects actually um, the facts. Um, we're often car caricatured as being sort of very disease focused and not, not worrying enough um, uh, about health systems and all that. The reality is we spend over a billion dollars a year on health systems. That makes the Global Fund, by some margin, the largest provider of grants for health systems. There's no other multilateral that comes from remotely um, uh, near us. We just haven't sort of, I don't think we've talked about that um, enough and been explicit enough um, about that being a core part of our um, message. So I know there'll be questions um, about why 14 billion. And, um, and uh, many people have said, yeah, nearly enough. You know, why aren't we asking for um, uh, much more? Um, absolutely, we, we, we could have asked for much more. Um, to get back to the global plan numbers, i.e. the numbers from WHO, UNAID, Stop TB, the original plan numbers for a trajectory, um, you would actually need to go and ask for about 30 billion. Um, uh, that's what it would take to get to um, that. The, the logic of the 14 billion is that is the number that gets you back to, as Robin said, the global fund strategy targets, which are a somewhat different trajectory to the um, uh, same endpoint. There's also a tactical point going on here. Um, and, you know, we can different judgments about tactics, and actually I think it's, it's fine to have um, a number of contrasting perspectives as we run through um, uh, this process, because some of our audiences will be um, uh, more responsive to some arguments than others. Um, but the fundamental thing we wanted to get away from is there have been a number of replenishments recently which have had ambitious targets, and, and the donors have completely ignored the targets. They just, the targets have been um, irrelevant because they've been so far away from what the donors have been thinking about that they had no, they played no part in the discussion. Um, what we wanted was a target that was framed as a flaw and that was stretching but near enough to be realistic. And, and, and that, we, that we should, that we didn't want a target that would, would be ignored. Um, and we also wanted to frame it as being, you need to do at least this. And so the message, um, uh, for example, to our major donors, including Canada, is, okay, you guys were all involved in defining the Global Fund strategy targets. You signed up to them. This is what it takes um, uh, to deliver them. If you think you're somehow going to get them by some other means, let's talk about what all the other assumptions, you know, more domestic resource mobilization. We're projecting a 48% increase in domestic resource mobilization, mobilization over, over the next period. That's a much more significant thing than we're asking donors to come up with. It's for us to push that assumption up any higher, it's just not realistic. Um, so I think we can have a quite, of, quite hard edge discussion about donors, about it, it needs to be at least 14 billion. And also, many of our donors have other things they want us to achieve whether it's around the border goals of SDG3 or particular things they're focused on, say around transition or around particular populations, uh, we basically have to go back and say, that's fine, we can do that. Um, but that's why it's at least 14 billion. You, you need to go beyond the 14 billion. Um, so we want to predicate the discussion on the working assumption sh should be, if you were serious when you signed up to the, the Global Fund strategy goals, you should be serious about increasing your contribution by, by at least 15%, because um, that's the difference between the fifth replenishment and um, uh, the sixth replenishment. But that's a flaw. If you're interested in doing other things, and if you're interested in the Global Fund being able to um, really turbocharge progress towards the broader goals of SDG3, um, then you've got to think bigger than that. Um, and so that's, that's the way we're framing it, as I say, you know, there's lots of choices about tactics, about um, how we do this. Um, the, the, ultimately, the test will be what we actually get, obviously. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and, um, you know, the reality is 14 billion is 1.8 billion more than um, 
we got in the fifth um, replenishment. It's a non-trivial um, sum, of, sum of money. Um, so quickly on um, Canada. Um, I think we should be pushing Canada pretty hard. Um, Canada increased its contribution by 24% um, uh, last time around. Um, if you look at the priorities um, for Canadian development assistance, which include sort of things like gender, health security, there's a good focus on TB. Um, they're very resonant with some of the things that we are pushing on um, very hard. Um, and also, I am making the point to countries like Canada that there's a time when many countries are retreating into nationalism. Um, this is not a time for the countries that believe in, in internationalism, in a global sense of humanity, to be on the retreat. They need, they need more than ever to be showing um, uh, leadership. Um, so, of course, um, uh, you will play a huge role in um, articulating and advocating for the investment case both here in Canada um, and elsewhere um, uh, in the world. I don't mind you. I'm not at all worried about you saying 14 billion is is not enough. We need that. We we need even more. That's fine. You know, <laughs> um, uh, the more we can get the sense in people's minds that 14 billion is a floor, that's that's a pretty good that's a pretty good uh, uh, place to be. Um, uh, and from your various perspectives, you can amplify and reinforce. Um, particular arguments, because as we all know, different constituencies respond more to a gender argument or a health security argument or a border development argument or a UHC argument, and each of you are in a different place to sort of drive them, and of course the constituencies around the um, um, individual diseases. So I thought probably I'd stop there. I'm very happy to take questions and um, uh, engage, and also to hear your perspectives, because it's not like we have all the um, uh, right answers here, and this is a this is a process that we're um, uh, in now, and there will be twists and turns along the way. A lot of the countries in which we're expecting donations from, there are elections or political complexities that we're going to have to um, uh, navigate, and and so it's um, uh, there will be kind of lumps and bumps along this, and there will also be a lot of key events, be it the G7 meetings, the G20 meetings, women deliver between now and actually our replenishment conference on October the 10th. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks so much. So now we'll go to questions. So maybe we'll start in the room and then everybody online can raise their hand or put in the chat box if you have a question. And just maybe you can remind people of your name when you ask a question. So do you? I will just pull up the mic here. Hi, can everyone hear me online? Yes, okay, take that as a yes. Um, my name is Adam Graham and I work with Plan International. I'm here with a few of my colleagues um, as well. Um, and I had kind of two questions and not so much in relation to sort of like the total ask amount, but more in the sort of nerdy implementation uh, side of things. And so I'm just actually curious because um, one of the things you mentioned, uh, rightly so, was that the Global Fund is interested in investing in uh, adolescent girls and young women. And that's a lot of the work that we do at Plan International is with um, adolescent girls and young women. We have a gender equality strategy it's, you know, the, that's sort of the, the core of our work. Um, <clears throat> the one thing from an implementer perspective that um, you know, we've noticed in the past is that sometimes in terms of the coordination at country level, uh, coordination of financing, uh, coordination of approach sometimes um, is, is slightly disjointed. And I'm just wondering from your perspective from the Global Fund, um, what advice would you have to give us as an implementer in order to kind of contribute to increasing coverage by, by coordinating a little bit more of that um, aid? And I'll give you an example. Um, in, um, you know, X country, let's say, Malawi, certain HIV investments may be using a kind of dreams model, as you had mentioned. Other investments may not be using that model at all. Um, and, and I think in, the, in the, sort of in the long run, that tends to um, in, inhibit kind of a, achieving the targets that we actually want to achieve. So, so I guess the question is twofold. What advice do you have to us as civil society implementers to really, um, you know, move into that 
into a, uh, to, to try to coordinate that aid and maybe from the global fund perspective too, in the next replenishment period, what, what, what would you have to, to say to that? And then the second question um, is just related to transition countries. So we know that countries are transitioning out of global fund financing. We also know that the epidemic still affects key populations in those countries where the financing is moving out of, um, you know, and some very simple investments, say for example, in M&E systems um, may actually help to achieve, um, you know, the, the, the targets that we have set amongst those key populations, but at the same time as the global fund money is moving out. So I'm just curious about um, sort of future plans for transition countries and what that looks like in terms of maybe not supporting a full you know, breadth of um, a program, but maybe making the kind of targeted investments where they need to be made in countries that are transitioning out of uh, global fund financing. Thank you. Um, would your question relate? Because I knew you had a question. Uh, no, no, no. Okay. Did you want to dive in? Okay. Collaboration around on the ground um, around uh, adolescent girls and young women. Well, the first thing I'd say is um, we're making a big thing about the need for increased collaboration, both at the global level and in country, um, as part of the investment case, uh, and saying you know we need to do that uh, as just um, um, to get in a sense more impact for every dollar um, spent. I think the adolescent girls and young women area is one of the more particularly challenging ones from that respect, because there are a lot of different people coming up with bright ideas about how to tackle the challenge, and they all think their idea is best, and that everybody should collaborate to help them. Um, and uh, my view is that ultimately, as in all these things, we have to find a way of letting the countries own the particular configuration, because ultimately, it's going to be their health systems, their education systems, their way of dealing with sexual violence and things like that, that are going to be the long term sustainable solutions. It doesn't mean we don't try and influence and shape and improve these things. But we've got to end up with something which isn't say, the dreams model imposed on them, but is Malawi's model um, uh, going forward. Um, and so the, the thing that I, I, I don't have a sort of, you know, silver bullet easy answer, but I, I would say two things. Uh, one is we, I think we've got to keep, all of us have to keep that in mind, is that ultimately we've got to end up with a solution, which is one that the government of the country is going to run with. And because that's the only way you will get things that impact every school, every clinic over the longer um, um, term. And, and that everybody sort of participating in this has to be somewhat adaptable, even if they think that they've got the perfect solution. Um, um, with, with with that in mind, um, uh, obviously in the you know places where the government is um, falling apart or doesn't have control of the country or whatever, there's, there's a sort of different set of um, uh, uh, issues. But but my view is on this: the, the problem is that too many people think they have the right answer and aren't being flexible enough um, uh, in working working with others. Um, and so suddenly we will be. Um, we will be trying to push this view of to make it scalable and sustainable. Um, we we have to be working, you know, with the way that the government works, um, and we want the partners um, to be doing that um, as well. Because I've seen too many really nice little projects, but the really nice little projects don't end up. They don't end up with a solution to the problem as a whole. They end up positively affecting, you know, small populations of people, which is great, but it doesn't really solve the problem. Um, on your second question, I, oh, transition countries. Um, we will be having, I am sure we will be having um, uh, prolonged discussion and debate about um, uh, transition um, uh, at the board and in the various um, uh, uh, committees. Um, look, again, th there isn't an easy solution um, to this because essentially the logic of transition is that we are asking um, governments 
to take on financial burdens they would prefer us to keep paying for. Um, and in some cases, to treat people they would prefer um, to ignore or neglect um, uh, in the case of sort of key populations. And so transition, in a sense, we shouldn't expect transitions to be always smooth. Um, there's going to be a tension and a, and a degree of um, discomfort around them. Um, we, we do think that there is a role for targeted investments and careful um, uh, planning. Um, I would say there is enormous diversity of view as to when you say targeted investment, which things to target. I mean, there are people who feel passionately that it's M&E systems. There are other people who say, you know, the thing you should really focus on um, in transition countries is civil society, and you can junk all the other stuff. And there are other people who say, the thing you should really focus on in transitions um, is ensuring procurement of um, um, quality, low-cost drugs, because that is often one of the weak points of transition. The trouble is, if you take all those views um, in and add them up, you haven't transitioned. <laughs> and, and so there are difficult, there are difficult choices um, uh, uh, to be made. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it is right that the board spends a lot of time debating this and working through um, sort of how our transition strategy um, evolves. The thing I think we can't avoid um, is that we have to have a transition strategy and we have, to, we have to be pushing wealthier countries to be taking on more of the burden themselves. Because there is the other side of the coin. We have countries like Mali and Niger and so on, which are extremely poor countries where there is significant unmet need, where if we could release some of the money from the, and redeploy some of the money from the rich countries, which really ought to be taking on the burden, um, we could save significant numbers of um, lives. Um, so it's, it, it is, and I think we have learned a lot. I mean, I, I, and, and we will learn, there's, um, Turg is doing the, um, uh, a review around all this at the moment. There'll be discussions um, particularly in the um, summer committees and in the board and um, towards the end of this year um, around all our sustainability and transition um, uh, policy. But I think it, it is something where we'll continually be trying to sort of optimize what the mix of interventions are. Great. Maybe Chris and then if anybody wants to go ahead. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. I'm Chris. Um, two questions. Uh, one around the 14 billion. Uh, I think 14 billion or, or even more would be great and a significant increase from also great. I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second. We're in a context of finite resources in Canada. I think it's fair to say, others may disagree, but we're not seeing a huge growth in Canada's ODA, probably elsewhere, you could say that. What's the messaging around from the Global Fund in that context? So for us, as we're advocating in Canada, presumably our overarching message is growth in ODA, so that it enables a contribution to things like uh, the Global Fund. So how do we frame that message going, from, going into the replenishment in a way that everybody's comfortable with an increased contribution from Canada, where we know there are competing priorities for a finite uh, pot of funds? So how can you help us understand what, why is the Global Fund increased investment the right one? I have a second question. <laughs> second question, uh, I just finished a stint uh, similar to what Robin's doing on the board uh, for the Global Fund. I was on the GFF Investors Group as a civil society uh, alternate rep. Almost every investors group meeting, the three Gs come up, coordination of the Global Fund, Gavi, uh, and the GFF. One of the struggles we've had as a civil society constituency in, within the GFF is civil society engagement, particularly uh, at the country level, meaningful participation of civil society. Part of it is that um, the GFF doesn't have as formalized a mechanism like the CCM uh, at, at country level. It uses existing mechanisms, potentially the CCM itself. So I'd just be interested in hearing from you a little bit, particularly at country level, about what work is happening in terms of coordination with GFF and Gavi. Thanks. Yeah. There's two questions. Yeah. So 
Marianne was asking, um, I actually put it up there, but um, what does Peter see as the role, if any, of data collected and analyzed by civil society regarding disease burden, treatment stockouts, and human rights violations? Framing this question within the situation in Venezuela and the investment of the Global Fund this year, in particular based on data provided by civil society, I'm assuming. And then Krako Aramaku, Aramaku sorry, has a question. Um, I appreciate your nuanced perspective on the importance of a realistic ask that doesn't make an inflated target in a effective form. Yet this seems to be misaligned with our likely unrealistic goal of ending HIV, poverty, hunger, etc. by 2030, for example. Do you think there needs to be a rethinking and downgrading of those broader health and policy targets so they are they too are more realistic with these resources likely to be secured through the replenishment process, or will we continue to use these health policy slogans to inspire action and what is possible? Right. Um, you're right that not just in Canada, but um, Overall, I would say um, there's no discernible upward movement in ODA. You know, a few countries are going up, a few countries are going down, but it's not like there's a, um, it's not like what we saw in the early years of the millennium where we saw a, a distinct upward um, uh, tick. And so there is a, there's a legitimate question of, are we um, simply going to be sort of taking market share for somebody else? Um, uh, and is that a good thing? Um, uh, and there are certainly um, things that I would be absolutely clear, I do not want to take money away from. So I would not want, I don't know what Canada does in terms of support of Gavi, but I would not want them taking money away from Gavi. And I do not want our arguments to be undermining Gavi's replenishment asks, particularly because it's going to be coming through um, in the first half of, um, uh, 2020, because I think they are a compelling investment, uh, and we should not um, uh, uh, undermine that at all. However, I would say that against a number of other types of uh, development spend, I think we can tell a very powerful story on return on investment. Uh, the um, you know the reality is is that a bunch of other things you do that many countries do around stimulating market development or infrastructure or whatever. If the people are sick and dying and the communities are overburdened um, by endemic malaria, for example, they're not going to take much advantage of these opportunities. Um, uh, and, and, and that having, um, improving the health of the community has been proven again and again and again to be just a very powerful enabler of all sorts of other things. Um, uh, happening. So we are making an argument in the sense to win market share from other sorts of development assistance. Of course, you should still be arguing for more um, overall development assistance, but realistically, there is no big trend on that at the moment. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, but I really would be, as I say, I I'd underscore the point of I don't want us to be doing things in a situation where it seems like Gavi gets sacrificed because people have stepped up there. Because I think that would be a, a bad place for us to be in, particularly because we are we are hand in glove with Gavi on on, on so many um, things. Um, which leads on to the next question. Um, we are hand in glove with Gavi on everything from strategic things to sharing a cafeteria and a building and to sharing an ombudsman to um, uh, situations on the ground where you know we provide the software package, they provide the training for it. It, it, it sort of, and this is, we are driving this even more. You will see Gary and the Global Fund doing a huge amount um, uh, uh, together um, across the spectrum um, of activity. Um, we are not really, we, we are not in the same place with um, GFF. Um, and that's partly because the GFF is um, fundamentally a, a front of, for the World Bank. Um, and the World Bank is a much more difficult beast um, to collaborate with. I mean, um, it, it, this is a little unfair, um, um, but the, the sort of the working collaboration model of the World Bank is one in which other people do what the World Bank wants to do. Um, uh, 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 and 
it's you know it is a big it's a great big aircraft carrier and it's difficult to change and all that kind of um, uh, stuff. Um, I would like to see us doing more, and we have a number of very significant initiatives um, on the way in, in 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 different countries. But it comes down to a lot of operational issues about the way, you know. So, for example, when we do blended finance transactions, um, we have incredibly painful negotiations around. Um, OIG access, so the access of our Inspector General to um, information around the blended finance um, uh, transactions, because the global fund, the World Bank attitude is trust us, go away. Um, and our OIG has a formal charter that doesn't allow them to do that. Um, and so we have to kind of work through the, we've got to make all that stuff much, much easier. Otherwise, the transaction cost for every transaction will be too high and will take. Um, uh, too long. I also think we need to keep coming back to the notion of um, we're doing this to support countries. That's why I've, I've pushed back somewhat on the notion of the GFF investment cases, because I don't think we should, any of us, we shouldn't have a global fund investment case in a country or GFF investment case. What we should all be doing is helping um, contribute to component parts of the national health financing strategy. Um, I know, but the, the language matters um, as, as to the way you frame it, as to whether you 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 frame it as, um, um, you know, but look, I'm, I'm, I think the focus of the GFF on maternal infant health nutrition is a really important focus. I think the um, idea of putting more money and more and using more of the IDA um, power um, for health, I'm absolutely behind. We've, 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 got to, we've, we've got to make the World Bank more flexible in the way it engages, or we've got to encourage the World Bank um, uh, uh, to be more flexible. And who knows, with the changes in leadership we're seeing, um, sort of how, how that will um, evolve. Um, uh, data, civil society. Well, to start with, um, uh, data on impact yeah, it's, it's not granular, granular enough and it's not fast enough. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and that's true for every, everybody who wants to use it, frankly. And my favorite example of this is malaria, where we get the World Malaria Report in November 18, which talks about what happened in 2017, which from an operational point of view is completely irrelevant. Um, because malaria is an extremely volatile disease where you, disease where you can get changes of, of incidence of 20 30 percent in a month. Um, so t talking about what happened a year ago um, is, is, is sort of like flying from one coast to another and you get to the Rockies and you're looking at a map of Chicago. It's, it's sort of really not very useful. Um, and um, Civil society can both play a role in the generation of that data at greater speed, the pressure to get it out at greater speed. I think there should be more voices saying we need, we need more of this data faster and we need it more granular. Um, uh, um, and then once it's there, we should, it shouldn't be hoarded. There is a bit of an issue of um, uh, the owners of data being slow to sort of disseminate them. Um, uh, and, and, and people taking months to perfect them before they're released, as opposed to, I would prefer to see sort of 95% accurate data released three months earlier, um, rather than having people, having people polish it. Um, uh, but that is, that's something where I, and I'm using malaria as the one to really push on, um, not because the others aren't important, but simply because the intrinsic volatility of malaria as a disease means that the slowness of the data process is, is particularly um, uh, important in undermining um, the efficacy of the fight. Um, in terms of, it, it's a really interesting question, the question about the 2030 um, deadlines. Um, you know, we will be pushed to hit the 2030 uh, deadlines um, to end the epidemics. However, what I would say is that we should be able to end the epidemics in significant parts of the world by um, 2030, and that alone, would, whether we end them in all the world, I suspect that'll be more um, challenging. But I think it's difficult to move off them because the 2030 deadline is not a deadline for these epidemics alone or indeed for SDG 3, but is the overarching um, deadline for the sustainable um, uh, 
development um, agenda. And also because it is a really good um, anchor. I mean, the, the global fund strategy targets aren't the global plan trajectory towards 2030, but they're not an unrealistic um, uh, trajectory um, uh, towards 2030. They just imply that you're slight, you're in a somewhat different place by the, by the time you, you've hit 2023. Um, the key point um, actually is that if, we're, if we continue to be significantly off track and not on a sharp downward trajectory in 2023, then I think we will be having to abandon the 2030 deadline. Um, uh, if we achieve the kind of change in trajectory that we put in the investment case, then we still will have significant challenges to hit the 2030 deadline, but it's not one where it's kind of blindingly obvious that you have to abandon it. it, it it'll still be um, stretching but attainable. Thanks. So again, I'm Katie from the Global Fund Advocates Network, and we're completely separate from the Global Fund Secretariat. Some of you've heard me talk about the network before, but it is a network for all of you as civil society and, and for community members. We have about 600 members around the world. Um, and I would just say, if you are a GFAN member, you would have received an embargoed copy of the, of the global investment case yesterday or the day before. I can't remember now. I feel like I've had it forever. I've had it so many times now. Um, and we published our own report um, last summer, um, which was called the Get Back on Track report, which indicated that a significant amount more than 14 billion was needed for the global fund to actually get back on track in terms of um, meeting the epidemics. And it's really great to hear you say today, you know, that there's a lot of space in your own in your own mind in terms of seeing the 14 billion as a flawed as a flawed ask in the sense that it's not sufficient to actually get us back to the global strategies and the global plans for the strategies. Well, you spend it every way. I'll adjust my notes. Um, but I mean, I think that what's, you know, I think that there's complementary roles for the Secretariat as well as civil society and communities when we're doing our advocacy. And what concerns me most about the investment case um, and some of the conversation here already this morning and what, what I don't see in the investment case is concrete information about what we could do if we had more than 14 billion for the global fund. It's clear we could get closer to being on track, but you know, there's, you know, the, the investment case already shows that there's a gap of, I think $18 billion, like outside of the 14 that would need to be filled to actually meet the strategy targets in the three year target. The, target, the, global target. The, glo the, the global plan targets. The strategy targets are measurable. Yes. Um, and it also sort of says that, you know, in terms of TB, you'll only get to about 63% of what is needed with the 14 billion in terms of, the of the global plans. Yep, yeah, yeah. totally. I don't think that Gear, if, if we're going to have any hope of actually making space for the conversation above 14 billion, it has to be that the strategy is understood as one thing and it's understandable that the investment case is geared towards the strategy from my perspective. I mean, it makes a lot of organizational sense, right? Um, but, what, but what I'm trying to get at and what is missing is the ability to advocate effectively around a greater number than 14 billion with what we've been given in the investment case. When the results report came out with the new methodology last year in 2018 that no longer has the same kind of ways that we attribute results for the global fund because it's a different methodology of accounting for life saved and you know other impact assessments um, we were promised that there would be a calculator included in the investment case that would give us some of that sort of similar to the rough calculator that was given in the fifth replenishment that said for every extra hundred million dollars you could accomplish xyz in terms of impact return on investment further leveraging of domestic resources, that kind of thing. That's not in the investment case. Now, maybe it's coming out in, as part of the media um, campaign, and that would be one of my questions, is is there going to be a calculator like that or some method of calculating what additional monies could bring? Because as advocates, it is a blunt tool, but it's actually a fairly effective tool for us in terms of being able to go to governments and ask for more. Um, 
And when it comes to communicating about it, I think my favorite thing so far was that I've seen is the private sector challenge. I think that, I don't know if I can call it that, but seemed to be a challenge that you were issuing to private sector around coming up with $1 billion in, in this replenishment. And I have a few questions that are pretty technical about whether you mean the private sector purely or private funders, including donations, because that's a very different amount of money in terms of what's being asked of the private sector. Um, but then the question for me is, that's a much bigger increase than what we're asking of donors in terms of the 15% as being a base, right? The private sector, depending on how you calculate it, is at least a 20% increase and could be as much as a 700% increase, depending on how you're counting the private sector. And so my- private sector includes private donors. So it's a 20% increase then, because it was about 830 million last time. So going from 830 to a billion. So, so it's like a 20% increase. So what is the, where, where do you see there being scope um, in terms of being able to do more than a, ask for more than a 15% increase? Like, is it around specific initiatives or themes like some of the ones that you were raising? Is it with specific countries? Is Canada one of those where you see that opportunity above 15%? I'm just curious about how we, how we get more information from the Secretariat to, to use the investment case as a jumping off point, because I think as global fund advocates and certainly for the network, we feel that it's not our job to make it easier for civil servants who are putting in their, you know, proposals to their treasury boards or their budget allocation, you know, met methodology. We want to really challenge, you know, those numbers. And so we probably will stick with, you know, that 14 billion is insufficient and that it's more like 18 billion that's really needed, just as a heads up. But, um, but using the investment case as a jumping off point, right? This is, these are the first seven floors. It's 20 story building, right? Or, you know, whatever, this is the first 14 floors, let's get to 18 and then, you know, we've, we've got a smaller gap. So I'm just curious, like what more we could expect from the secretary in terms of additional analysis around how much more, you know, we can raise and then where you see scope for that above 14 billion. Yeah, take that from us. Sorry. Okay, I mean, there's basically two different sets of questions there. One is about the ask, and then the other is about um, where the money comes from. Um, in terms of um, uh, the ask, I mean, I think it's it's a fair point to have a discussion about, um, and we can talk about. Uh, What, what are the ways of giving some texture to what you could do with money above um, uh, 14 billion? I'm, I'm not aware of the promise of around a calculator that certainly didn't come anywhere near me. Um, uh, but um, in, in any case, um, uh, I, I know that, for example, Stock TV are very happy to provide very clear uh, articulation on what they would do with more money. Um, uh, I don't think there's any problem in 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 uh, articulating um, that because I was um, with the Stop TV Borders this week and I was there um, on Monday. Um, and look, the other thing I think that's important here is that um, having the, having a discussion around what you can do with more than fourteen billion and why that's important and what that means for individual donors is quite a good place to be having the discussion. Um, I don't mind having that discussion um, uh, uh, at all um, because um, it, it effectively implicitly sets 14 billion as the floor and, and then says, well, that implies that donors are gonna have to um, uh, start by thinking about 15%. Um, and then let's have a discussion about the things that are important to them and important to the overall objective and which require money over um, uh, and above that. Um, in terms of the um, uh, private sector ask, look, there's no sort of um, uh, massively sophisticated um, methodology behind it. Um, a billion is a round number, which is roughly 20%. Um, it would have seen been a bit odd to have asked for sort of 950 or 1 billion and 50 or what, you know, because there is no sort of, um, um, uh, but, but the reality is we think that we, we, need, we need a step up from the private sector. Um, uh, but we should also be realistic. You are not going to get 
corporates writing very large checks. Um, uh, and we would want some degree of step up from philanthropy. Um, and, the one, and the private sector contributions, I think, are important not just for their money, but because they often bring other sorts of skills and infrastructure and, and you know, diff they bring different things to um, uh, the party. And, and certainly, you know, that was the thrust of a lot of my discussions mm -hmm. at Davos was, uh, yes, we want your money, but we also want the other things you can, um, uh, uh, you can bring. Um, when you look at the um, spectrum of donors to your sort of broader question about sort of where's the money going to come from, um, I would say at the moment we have uh, a spectrum of some donors who are seriously considering very significant increases um, uh, to um, donors where um, they haven't really got their head around it at all yet. I mean, they're still at a fairly early stage um, uh, in the process. And that is, that is one reason we are very keen to get some um, of this of the increasing countries um, to announce relatively early, because that was helpful in, 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 in sort of setting the tone um, uh, and the momentum. Okay. Can I just add our, our comms department has put together a breakdown for each hundred million. Oh, we, have, we, we have done that and uh, they put it together this month so it's fresh and that's something that we can share with you. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. And then I'm sure you have one other. So uh, regarding the global fund strategic objective, we know that as being an implementer, the objective three relative to uh, promote and uh, protect human rights and gender equality is the one that uh, we should be far away. And uh, I really appreciate uh, the regional project where we can use uh, to, to advance uh, the uh, human rights in a certain number of countries. And I'm wondering if uh, with the next replenishment, uh, we cannot focus on regional project to improve uh, more regional project to improve uh, gender equality uh, on this kind of uh, uh, global fund grant implementation. Because usually what we, we realize uh, during the uh, country uh, funding request, most of time this part is a way of uh, the funding. And having uh, 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 an allocation for regional projects will allow Global Fund to advance uh, this part of uh, the objective. Yeah, I mean, I think... Here, we will just grab the microphone. Yeah. 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 Well, okay, so this is a um, second question from someone that I already went from. Uh, from Glasgow, quick question, sorry. Um, the growing trend toward donor alignment and collaboration is very encouraging. While a much smaller partner, the Robert Carr Fund for Civil Society Networks, is an excellent example of an innovative funding mechanism that is governed by equal representation of civil society and donors, including the Global Fund. RCF, the Robert Carr Fund, focuses on core funding of civil society networks. Her focus on core funding of civil society networks is essential, and that the framing of complementary mechanisms that investments in both RCF and the Global Fund for example, are not duplicative but necessary for sustainable implementation is a message I hope you can continue to share throughout the replenishment process. And then Brent Allen had a question. The premise of resourcing country-based programs, a foundation of the global fund investment decision-making, minimizes the profound health challenges facing migrant and mobile populations, especially those who often live in a state of suspended animation. Between their country of origin, the countries through which they move and the country where they aim to settle. Increasingly global issues, uh, such as climate change and geopolitical instability are increasing global migration rates to volumes never seen previously and affecting countries and regions in ways we have yet to fully comprehend. This key population presents higher risks to TB, malaria and HIV and yet often are excluded from country-based health system resourcing. 
Racism, cultural and religious prejudice and xenophobia often mean this population does not fit nicely into a country based response. How is the Global Fund preparing for meeting the increasing negative health effects on migration and mobile populations? I just want to make sure I have one more. So there was the regional trials, there was the migrant and mobile populations, there was the civil society network, Robert Carr. Robert Carr, the importance of complementary. That one was worse. He was more, yeah. It was deep. Yeah, yeah. Um, we are going through, it's sort of relevant to all of these actually. Um, we're going through um, a very important process at the moment, which goes to the strategy committee. Um, and then goes on from the strategy committee to the board, um, which is around the catalytic times. Um, and for those of you who are less familiar with the Global Fund, the way it works is um, when we get our, for argument's sake, 15 billion, um, uh, what we do is we say, um, over the next three years, we're gonna need this for operating expenses. We're gonna take out a certain amount for catalytic funds, and I'll come back to explaining what those are. And then we allocate the remainder on uh, the basis of disease burden and essentially the inverse of GNI per capita, i.e. the more disease and poorer country it is, the more it gets. Um, the, the thing that's being um, uh, debated um, as we speak um, and will be a big focal point of the next round of strategy committee meetings um, is the size composition of the, the um, catalytic funds. And the catalytic funds are designed to, um, they're basically designed to acknowledge that a country-led model has some great strengths, but it also has some disadvantages. And one of the disadvantages is that it won't naturally do things, deal with regional problems. Um, and so if you want regional initiatives on human rights, or if you want to deal with um, migrant population, refugee populations and so on, a country-led model doesn't necessarily work that well um, uh, for that. The other reason we use, the other typical reason we use um, catalytic funds is where we want to encourage countries to put a greater focus on something than we think they will do naturally. And so, for example, in the last round, we had catalytic funds around innovative programs around missing people with TB, around um, adolescent girls and young women. So things that were sort of pushing the envelope in terms of what we wanted programming um, uh, to focus on. Um, there's a, as you can imagine, um, there are lots and lots of people who want different catalytic funds for different things. And our challenge as a secretariat is to ensure that we don't kind of fragment it so that we end up with lots of little funds that don't actually move um, the dial on any. Um, we, we, our, our challenge is to make sure um, that we have something that's sort of operationally going to have um, uh, impact. Um, and, um, but there will certainly be a lot of discussion around the role of regional grants around um, uh, human rights. I can't tell you how that conversation um, will end up because there are actually different perspectives on, on how effective um, uh, those programs are, um, and they're strongly held um, in different directions. <laughs> um, so that, that, that debate will take place. I think there will be um, actually a lot of support for um, the notion that we do need funding around, um, and we have had funding around migrant populations um, uh, because they obviously, you know, the, we have many situations in the world where we have displaced people, and as the question says, they are disproportionately vulnerable um, to these diseases. We're seeing very high rates of TB, for example, um, in refugee camps. Um, and, and so I, I would be surprised if we don't see something around catalytic funding um, uh, coming out of that. And so the, the Secretariat is, is, is very supportive um, of that. Um, the, 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 I'm not, yeah, well, I'm not sure how much of it was a question as much as a statement. Look, I'm, I see one of the greatest strengths of the Global Fund being the way civil society is embedded sort of in every aspect of what we do from governance of the board all the way through 
um, the committees and, uh, and implementation. Um, and in, indeed, um, coming back to the earlier question about sort of cooperating with others, one of the things we find difficult actually in cooperating with other multilateral institutions is that they don't have that. And, and they find it difficult to do, deal with the fact that we embed civil society in, and a lot of them have sort of civil society um, in a nice little advisory box, um, uh, which gets listened to, but has no decision-making authority. Um, and, and that's a kind of different model. Um, uh, and, and so we, we, we do see that as a, 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 one of the things we have to work on as we work more and more closely with um, uh, other institutions. Um, but, but I mean, it's, so, so actually, I mean, I, most of these questions I'm just kind of agreeing with um, uh, in, in flavor. But I think the thing that it does underpin, and Robin will know this well from being sort of directly involved, is that we actually are going to be making a lot of really, really important decisions um, between now and the May board. Um, and we really need the board, for, the Secretariat's perspective is, we need the board to make those decisions because we do not want cash hanging around on our balance sheet not being used. You don't save any lives with cash on the balance sheet. Um, and, but to be able to, what we want to be doing is having the replenishment conference in October, rapidly sending out allocation letters, moving swiftly into the programming for um, uh, the next cycle. Um, but for that to be possible, these, these decisions of how much do we take out of the pot for catalytic funds, um, what are the guidelines around things we're prioritizing or not prioritizing in the grant in the core grant process, all that has to have been decided um, um, before then, so we can kind of get moving. Um, and one of the things we've learned is a lot of the catalytic funds actually were slow to because the decisions were made late in the last cycle. So they've all been rather slow to get off the ground. And, and we don't want we don't want to have that replicate itself um, in, in this cycle. Thanks. I know we're kind of running close to the end. Robin, I know you had some comments. Does anybody else have really quick last question, comments? Stuart, say something provocative. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is Stuart, uh, Scanner Director of One Campaign. Um, very practical, very quick. It's an election year in Canada. What's the right timing for a Canada pledge and how can we help? And is the pledge, the Canada pledge important because we were the previous host as a catalyst for others to step up as well? Anybody else? I mean, it's one of the things I, I want to discuss with the government today is, is what timing would work for them. I mean, certainly from, from our perspective, what we would like to see is Canada announcing an increased pledge relatively early. Um, you can pick your occasion. Um, you know, if you, I, women deliver would be one, you know, obvious um, uh, opportunity, very high profile. Um, uh, and there's a, there's, and it, what it would also do is reinforce the linkage between the gender agenda and what the global fund is doing. And you only have to focus on things like adolescent girls and young women and so on to, to, um, to see that connection. Um, uh, now, how that works for the government, I don't yet know. Um, uh, but that kind of timing, sometime before the summer break, um, seems to me what we what we want to aim for. Is it important? <laughs> I think it's Canada's voice will be disproportionately important, partly because um, of the fact that Canada was the last host, and it, it, it shows that it's sustained commitment. It wasn't just a kind of one-off because we happened to be hosting sort of thing. Um, and partly because Trudeau is seen as a champion for a vision of the way the world should be dealing with these sorts of challenges. Uh, and, um, you know, his voice is, is, a, is, a, is a 
very powerful voice um, in a world when there, there aren't that many champions <laughs> of that kind of um, uh, 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 vision of the world. Um, so, yeah, late spring, early summer, um, a bigger number, it's very important. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so I know Rob is going to make some final comments. I just want to make sure that we thank um, Shelly and Shane and Katie, who are the ones that really put this together. And Shelly spent a long time last night trying to figure out the technology for this room. So thank you guys. And, uh, I'm, I'm conscious of uh, the, this question. Did you? Oh, one more question, though. Yeah, this is from Brent. Oh, i.e. the Global Innovation Fund are providing new opportunities for channeling channel, channel, traditional donor funding to improve global health. What is the forward agenda for the Global Fund in establishing new financing paths which truly exploit and encourage innovation and entrepreneurial activity? I like to throw in innovation, hashtag innovation. Um. Okay, the, 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 the Global Fund, um, one of the Global Fund committees, the AFC committee, and actually the strategy committee looked at this as well, and then the board um, just recently reviewed um, uh, uh, sort of our approach to uh, innovative finance. Um, a couple of things, um, to, <laughs> three things I'd say about it. Um, one is, um, it's gotta be additional. We, we don't want donors thinking that they can dress up some soft credit as an alternative to um, providing grants because that is not going to help us achieve our mission. Um, uh, the second is um, we need to keep the focus on what it is we are trying to achieve and then talk about the mechanisms that help us finance those objectives rather than going around with um, uh, hammers looking for nails. And I'm afraid the innovative finance world is full of people with their particular solution that they sort of want to apply, whether it's social impact bonds or whatever thing you want, results-based finance or whatever, that they want to apply to something. And I think I mean, there are things where different types of financing solution make sense, but let's start with the thing rather than the um, uh, financing um, uh, solution. Um, the third point I'd make and I say this as somebody who spent quite a bit of my life in um, uh, banking um, and has seen um, an awful lot of financial innovation, some of which had rather disastrous consequences, um, is that innovative finance has a role to play. It is not a magic money machine. Um, most of what innovative finance will do is Get, help us get more impact from existing dollars. Um, it will only on the margin produce more dollars. But that is not to underestimate its importance. Getting more impact from existing dollars is a good thing to do, and we should definitely um, uh, do it. Um, uh, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't sort of see it as something that will miraculously um, resolve um, the challenges um, we face. I do see um, lot, I would like to have more kind of blended financings, and that's why, particularly the sort of cooperation with the likes of the World Bank, in some in some countries and in some situations, it does make sense to do those sorts of transactions. And so, for example, we're negotiating something with India and the World Bank around TB at the moment, um, which, when that if that comes off, releases significantly. Um, enhanced funding for um, uh, TB. And India is a country with the capacity to sort of take that on and make that happen. It wouldn't be necessarily an appropriate solution to do that kind of transaction in all the environments um, in which we operated. Done. Great. Well, first off, I just want to thank Scott and especially Peter for being here with us today and everybody in the room, everybody online um, from all over the world in all corners of Canada from coast to coast to coast. Um, a really provocative, stimulating discussion and one that will be continued. Um, just a, a couple of thoughts here. Um, again, 
to the Global Fund Secretariat computer, thank you very much for meeting with civil society. It is highly um, appreciated. And we recognize and we value um, our partnership together and uh, look forward to continuing to work with uh, the Secretariat along the replenishment and ensuring a fully funded global fund. I guess, you know, um, one of the resounding uh, points, I think, coming from this conversation today, and I'm sure with many, um, is in your conversations with the Canadian government later on today, is around the at least 14 million um, ask, is to perhaps begin the conversation with the broader visioning of what is achievable with a 16 to 17 to 18 billion dollar replenishment. Um, really just to underline and emphasize that we are asking for at least 14 million. Because I feel, and from what I'm hearing, both internationally and from, from groups in the room and online, is that that at least is the part that gets left to anger is not as loud as 14 million. And so to emphasize the fact that this is the floor, not the ceiling, maybe to, to start off the, the conversation with Canada and with others, I, what could be the ceiling? And what it could do for the Global Fund in terms of not only meeting its strategy targets, but exceeding the strategy targets. So that's one thing. Um, you know, it's been a very helpful conversation, both, um, you know, in terms of giving you a very broad briefing um, in advance of your meetings today with government, but also hearing from you and all of the, our advocates and, and partners um, at the meeting today, hearing from you and thinking about how we can integrate your messages into our own advocacy. So that's really helpful. Um, I'm not sure to what extent uh, you are aware or folks online and in the room are aware, um, but in terms of a Canadian civil society ask, we are really aiming to be as ambitious as possible. So um, understanding the word of maintenance being something that is um, a common um, theme, I think, across the donors is to maintain pledges. We're really looking at how we can be very innovative in how we apply that maintenance. So does it mean maintaining a 20% increase for Canada? Because that's historically what we have done. Um, does it mean uh, maintaining the 804 million, which is what? Or, uh, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> so it means a um, uh, million from the sixth, the fifth replenishment, or is it a maintenance of Canada's proportional share of the global fund replenishment target, which is around 5.5%, which would kick the, the Canadian replenishment contribution to around 1 billion Canadian dollars. We're looking at an ambitious pledge or an ambitious ask to the Canadian government of that $1 billion. So we really hope that you, this message will be echoed throughout your meetings later on today. And as we move forward, um, let's see. Uh, in terms of key priorities for Canada, I think we've heard a lot of the key buzzwords, including uh, gender equality, adolescent girls and young women, sexual reproductive health and rights, kids um, at risk under five, defending human dignity, advocating for human rights and driving the needle forward on that, good governance, innovative financing, health security, and so on. So I'm sure all of these issues will come up again over the course of your meetings today um, with the Canadian government and, um, and, and moving forward. And, and finally, um, just to folks in the room um, and online, it would be wonderful if we could organize uh, with Scott and with Laura a, a debrief afterwards um, about to hear back from you about the conversations that you've had later on today so that we together can start to strategize about how we can help you get to that one billion Canadian ask. I like the one billion. Yeah, it's and it's a, a, it's a nice round number. It's a nice round number, exactly. And it talks about, you know, continued Canadian leadership and not looking at a dollar value, um, but looking at the percentage of an overall contribution. Yep. So 
Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, great to see you. Great to see you online. Uh, nice to have you on the phone with us. We will be in touch, um, and you will receive all a soft copy of these uh, materials that we've had here today. So thank you again, and have a great day.